Oh, hey, thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I, um, I woke this morning with an awful sense of um, ennui. Ennui. And I thought to myself, how can this conceivably be the case? It's an it's a extraordinarily beautiful September day. I'm going to cross the Potomac, and I'm going to be in the company of my mentors and my seniors and my teachers, my professors, Daniel Jennett, Richard Dawkins, Samuel Harris, and I'm also going to see again my new neighbor and my new best friend, and I say it with um, platonic platitude, my love. Uh, the three most beautiful words in the new secular dictionary, Ayan Hersi Ali. <laughs> uh, while I'm saying that, I should add that, um, that it is considered by me, and I hope by all of you, a, a national disgrace that in the capital city of a secular democracy and republic that our guest from Holland, the first, I think, political refugee from Western Europe since 1945, should have to go under armed guard about her business rather than be our most honored guest. <laughs> and though it's not usual for me to be able to speak for the majority, I think I can say <laughs> that, Ayan, there isn't anyone in this room who wouldn't very proudly stand between you and anyone who wished you harm. <clears throat> and then I suppose I might add that those feelings of human solidarity and empathy and decency do not require divine permission. Uh, I do not proceed from the divine spark. In fact, in bold contrast, those feelings of elementary human solidarity and dignity and decency, in fact, have to be asserted against the divine and those who believe that they monopolize it. So how's that for my intro? Okay. I, my plan, I have now used the word majority, which was the source I suddenly realized of my ennui. Um, I, I've... This is the first time this year I've been in a room full of people who agree with me. <laughs> and, uh, and a tremendous sense of, of boredom and futility overcame me at this idea. <laughs> and I was, think, I was actually thinking of holding it right there and saying, look, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, and friends, brothers, sisters, my impression is, and I, I don't think I'm mistaken, that people like yourselves come to events like this um, not to listen. Um, or not just to do so, but also to speak, to impart. And I can certainly say that in this room there are many people. I've mentioned them already. I should also add my friend Matthew Chapman. I think I've earned my keep, wouldn't you agree, by making sure that he came to this conference? <laughs> I could see him bringing out the heterosexual in some of you uh, as, he, as he spoke today. Um, so that I had thought really of saying, look, I, I, will, I will not shirk my task. I will end up doing the bulk of the talking, but that we ought to uh, turn it over, as it were, to yourselves. And then I thought that might be a slight cop-out. But I'm going to yield back the balance of my time very quickly. Um, nonetheless, after I've made, I, th I thought I'd give you two or three things I think I've learned from the last year on campaign um, in, in our common struggle. And I'll just mention them quickly. I even wrote some of them down. Um, the, first is, the first thing I want to say is that uh, every time I've debated with anyone, from some moon-faced Baptist to some smug rabbi um, or smarmy Catholic, uh, always, it's always come up, and it's often been asked also by people who don't belong to those categories, well, how would you know that there could be goodness or virtue uh, or morality without... Uh, a supernatural dictatorship to enforce it. Hmm? It's odd how people, when they're trying to be polite, are so insulting. Um, 
When I, when I was asked, when you say religion poisons everything, do you mean everything? As, <laughs> as in, say, chess. Uh, well, in a, yes, in a way, because uh, it, it, it attacks us in our deepest integrity. It says that we would be nothing, that we would have no principles, no humor, no irony, no decency, if we were not the property, the born property of a supernatural dictatorship and yearned for its rewards or feared its punishment. It attacks us in our, in our core. Uh, and it does so in a related way that I think is also quite close to the core, don't know about you, by deforming our sexuality in, in the same manner, by saying that all of this too is a source of guilt and shame and fear. So yes, of course, it is poisonous. And we shouldn't grant the idea that even if metaphysically untrue, which it most certainly is, that religion is nonetheless the teacher of morals. It is, to the contrary, the source of misery, guilt, shame, unhappiness, and immorality. So given that you're all going to be having this argument either singly or in collective terms uh, from now on, I, here's a, a suggestion I've made, and I've made it on a, a number of websites now, including some religious ones. I've made it in public, I've made it in print. Your antagonist has to be able to do the following thing. He has, or she, has to name a moral action performed or a moral statement made by a believer that could not be made or performed by an unbeliever. Now, I've been doing this for months now. It's been on the Christianity Today website. It's been on uh, Sally Quinn's wonderful uh, site that I hope you visit, On Faith, the Washington Post Newsweek uh, pages, and many other places. And I haven't, and I've been doing it for months, I haven't yet had one reply, except the injunction to love your enemies, which I don't think is a moral one. <laughs> Do I love the theocratic suicide murderers? No, I don't. <laughs> I dislike them. Um, I wish to encompass their defeat. Uh, they wish to be martyrs? Okay, I'm here to help. Um, But it would be positively immoral to say that one loved them. It would be disgraceful, cowardly, and masochistic to say so. And there, in three words, you have the root of Christianity. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's, I suppose, why no Christian leader took the occasion of the <clears throat> theocratic, barbaric assault on our civil society to say that now was the moment to declare our love for these fascistic goons. So, um, my challenge also has a corollary, and you can try this on an audience too. Um, please, can you think of an um, immoral statement made, or an immoral, wicked action performed by someone that could only have been religious? It's very strange. No one has any difficulty coming up with an answer right away to that. They can't answer the first, and they can't avoid the second. I won't say it's a QED, but I think that's very suggestive. I pass it on for what it may be worth. Second, um, Professor Dawkins, I meant to ask you this earlier. Um, how long would you say Homo sapiens have been on the planet? Our species. I've, I've read discrepant. You want me to answer? Yes, would you? I mean, I'd like your best idea of how many years our species has been on the, on the crust. Well, it would depend a little bit on uh, how you defined it but probably it would be measured in hundreds of thousands of years. Yes, okay. I've, I'm grateful because uh, I, Carl Sagan once said he thought about a quarter of a million, but he wasn't completely certain. I've read estimates that it's less, but let's, let's say it's 100,000. Well, it's, it's a quarter of a million. Yeah, well, a quarter of a million is a lot. It's more than I need. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about the professor. Scrupul the great thing about Professor Dawkins, scrupulously objective, but very generous. Um, <laughs> Very well. Let's call it 100,000 years that Homo sapiens has been on the planet. I'm addressing the point about the non-overlapping magisteria. The, the, whether, is it really true that there's an incompatibility between science and religion, or can they rub along? Let's help with the assisted suicide of this fatuous proposition <laughs> and show that there's a radical incompatibility. Let's assume that we've only been around for 100,000 years, in the course of which time, People were born, most of them, a good number of them at any rate, a large, a high proportion of them dying in the process of being born, 
or killing their mothers in that process, live for many, many, many thousands and thousands of years, probably not longer than two and a half decades, eventually dying either of their dentition, which they didn't understand, or of microorganisms that they didn't know existed. Meanwhile, conducting vicious and venomous turf wars with each other, almost invariably carrying rival fetishes into the fray to demonstrate their moral superiority over others. And that this went on with all its attendant misery and, and uh, gruesomeness, perhaps with a slow upward curve towards the magnificent mammals that we are today, <laughs> superb primates that constitute this meeting. And that's how it looked, that's how it was. And heaven watched that with folded arms for 94,000 years. <laughs> and then about 6,000 years ago, it's time to intervene. <laughs> In or around Bronze Age Palestine by means of various human sacrifices. Now, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't without difficulty be, be brought to believe in a virgin birth. It would take a lot to make me believe in that. I, I do think, I, apparently there is such a thing as parthenogenesis. I don't really believe in resurrection, though according to the Bible it was very commonplace at the time. <laughs> no big trick to it. Um, all the graves opened at the time of the crucifixion and the inhabitants got out and walked around Jerusalem according to St. Matthew. So what, what's so important about just one more? But um, I, I, would, I, would, I could be brought to believe in this. I, I can't be brought to believe in the hypothesis that I've just given you. That cannot be true. It cannot be true. It is flat out not true. And if it were true, it would mean, as all such religious hypotheses do, that we won that argument too, because that's either a very bad design, a very inept and stupid one, or it's a very wicked and evil one. So that, I think, is a QED. And I thought I might pass that on to you, or as they say in some of the religious communities where I go, share it with you. <laughs> um, finally, this is a very fair-minded and decent and polite and open-faced society in the United States, um, of which I'm so proud to have become a citizen, taking my oath at the Jefferson Memorial um, on his birthday, which happens also to be mine, otherwise I wouldn't have made such a, a presumptuous gesture. <laughs> and uh, swearing, uh, not just under my breath, but in the ceremony afterwards, uh, explicitly to the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, uh, the, the basis of our magnificent First Amendment, and making a short speech about President Jefferson's letter to the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, who were frightened of being massacred by the Congregationalists of Danbury, Connecticut. <laughs> Um, wished the security of the state against religious persecution and assuring them that there would forever be a wall of separation between church and state in the United States, and uh, thus coining my new slogan, in which I also invite you to join me, Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. <laughs> <clears throat> but exactly and precisely because of the uh, open-mindedness and fair-mindedness and decency and friendliness and hospitality of the United States, I think one has to confront the argument, most recently adumbrated by the president and leader of the free world, uh, George Walter Bush, who says, teach the argument. Let's, ha let's hear both sides on evolution versus creationism. <laughs> You'd be surprised by how tenacious that view is uh, uh, how tenaciously, I mean to say, that view is held by some people. But I, I, I feel one might help uh, to get us over some of that hurdle too. First, there isn't an argument. <clears throat> There's not. You don't hear people saying, well, children, uh, chemistry class is over, and then we'll have a break, and then there'll be the alchemy period. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> After we've done our astronomy, darlings, um, it'll be the astrology class. Um, you don't get that, and of, of course it would be ludicrous if, uh, and hateful if it were proposed, but under the cover of religion, there's no stupidity that can't be advocated. And, well, I learned about um, Darwinism originally from reading up the debate between Thomas Huxley, coiner of the term agnostic, and Bishop Wilberforce, known as Sophie Sam, 
um, at the Natural History Museum in Oxford University. And I learned a lot from studying it as a debate. I think that should be taught, all right? I think people should be made to read about the confrontation uh, between William Jennings Bryan and his opponents. Uh, and they should be made to particularly to read the recent book by H.L. Mencken of all his collected writings on the man, Bryan, who he called, I think too kindly, the idol of all morondom. <laughs> um, and Clarence Darrow. I'm, 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 I am for the dialectical method, in case you wonder. In fact, Matthew's socialist rant this morning made me feel quite young again. Um, so, <clears throat> but um, if that's going to be the case, and if, if we are going to teach the argument, then there's another corollary, which I call to your attention. Any church that gets a tax break, or any church that gets any subsidy from the faith-based initiative, has to teach Darwin in Sunday school. <laughs> Is the president aware of this implication? <laughs> I'll take leave to doubt it. Um, should he and his supporters and uh, uh, friends be made aware of it? Yes, I think so. Anywhere it happens in your community, or near your community, any time that you have a Dover, Pennsylvania in, in your neighborhood, make sure that this point doesn't get lost. So these were the three things that I wanted to share that I felt I'd learned from the trail. And I hope they've been some help. And I really would now. I prefer to be your hostage, and it's been very nice of you to have been my prisoners. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. We have our first question here. Linda, please speak. Um, hi, Christopher. Hello. I'm Canadian, so my perspective is... Canadian Eurocentric, not one, American. One nation under Canada. You <laughs> <laughs> gave an excellent um, presentation at the University of Toronto on free speech. It's on Richard Dawkins' website if people haven't had an opportunity to watch it. Um, and this is a question I wanted to ask Diane and I can get a chance to. And it's concerning our lack of free speech when it comes to Islam in the um, Europe, Canada, uh -huh. America. We can criticize literally any religious uh, philosophy, ideology, but when it comes to Islam, we are forbidden and we are stopped essentially. And, no, and most newspapers are afraid of publicizing anything that criticizes Islam. Um, during the uh, controversy over the, the Danish cartoons, which everyone here will remember, which I think was the most suggestive such episode. Um, I went on CNN to debate with some ghoul from some Islamic clerical organization. And I said to the presenter, Look, just before we start on this, um, you have just pretended to show the cartoons on the uh, <coughs> screen, but you've, what is the word they use for drizzling them out so you actually can't see them? Pixel them out. <coughs> and you haven't done this, I think, out of respect for uh, one monotheism. You've done it because you're afraid haven't you? You, you? you and your bureaus are afraid. They, and she said, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, in that case, I want to say to the person I want to debate with that that's the relationship he has with, with the media, that he's on here with a gun in his hand, or at least on the table, that he can pick up if he chooses. I just want to get that out of the way right now and have it clearly understood. I've been working in this profession for a very long time. I know many of the editors who wouldn't run those cartoons, and uh, including my editor at Slate, who said, we're not running them. You can link to them from your page, if you like. <laughs> which I did, but um, we're not. Um, and it was, a, a, I think, a national disgrace. This, uh, we make our, I don't make my living from the First Amendment, though I do. It's my life, the First Amendment. I hope I don't sound exaggerated to say it's my life, the principles of, of that amendment. And it, I have no right to betray it. And it's not to be handed off uh, to the first bunch of clerical bullies who come round to the office. And that's what happened without a struggle. That's what I didn't like about it. And then, when a magazine I also do write for, a Free Inquiry in Amherst, which I'm sure, I hope you all get, did run the cartoons, Barnes & Noble said they wouldn't carry the magazine. In fact, they pulled it from the rack. I told my publishers, I'm not doing a single event at Barnes & Noble ever again. And I never will. <laughs> so... 
So that's the fear factor, the blackmail factor, the sheer intimidation factor. But I think there's a much worse and more insidious one. There are many people who say, well, it's not that we're afraid, though they are. It's that we mustn't be mean. We, we've got to respect. We must, uh, we must uh, defer to religious sensibilities. Uh, this is far, far more dangerous. Because eventually it's going to mean, it already does mean, has meant recently at the Washington Post, to take another cartoon example, that boring cartoonist you probably don't bother with on the funny page is called Burke Breathed. He did some Ramadan cartoon or another. I don't know what it, I did look at it. It wasn't, it wasn't terrifically funny. Nor was it really very offensive, but it was shown by the editors of the Washington Post to the Muslim staffers, say, if we ran this, would your feelings be hurt? They said, well, if you're going to ask them and give them the chance to have a, an emotional veto, who would miss such a chance if they belonged to some cult? They said, yes, it would offend us. It didn't, didn't run. Again, crying before they hurt. Let's look for ways to surrender. Let's find a way to run up the white flag. This has got to stop. It has to stop right now before it becomes impossible to oppose, before it's established itself as a principle within our culture. And I'm not sure we have very much more time before that's where we'll be. Christopher, we did our part. If you saw the uh, cartoon that was created that included all of our speakers, uh, you'll notice on one part of the scale there is someone that looks like Mohammed, of a, Osama bin Laden. No, that's really the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> We're not scared. <laughs> Next question. Hi, um, I'm currently a, a resident of East Harlem, and I every Sunday go out and I see the you know the people in their dress. And I also saw recently um, your debate with uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton about God, yeah. and I I notice uh, very anecdotally in the community that I'm living in now that there's a strong correlation between people of faith and people who are um, able to sort of rise above the fray in terms of the, the general um, you know prostitution drug addiction that I see so frequently. Um, I'm wondering if you think that the discourse, the public discourse, I mean looking at the crowd are obviously very solidly middle class, your, your readers are mostly middle class I assume, if the discourse should be different, or, or if, if you could choose a different discourse to talking about people, even globally, who are typically very poor, I feel like our discourse is very middle class centric. Mm. Um, look, I've had this before, um, and now I'm having it again, and so thank you for giving me the opportunity. When I, when I first um, unmasked my batteries against the ghastly uh, Mother Teresa, or, or what's motherly about her? <laughs> <clears throat> hideous virgin um, and fraud uh, and fanatic and fundamentalist, shriveled old bat. Um, <laughs> as, far from, as far from the nurture of motherhood as a woman could decently get. Anyway, when I first said what I thought about her, people said, it would have been 20 years ago that Bishop Fulton Sheen or someone like that would have said, you have offended, you've blasphemed, you've uh, you, you profaned the sacraments of the Holy Mother Church. Something like that would have used to be said. Does, you don't get that anymore. You're told, no, you've upset the Catholic community. And bear in mind, many poor Guatemalan immigrants and uh, others go to these churches and they, uh, you, you're upsetting them and just depriving them of comfort. And you know, that's what's supposed to be the moral blackmail involved, very much the same as involved in the, in the, the cow tying to Islam, by the way. And the, the case you mentioned, which is why in my book I go so far out of my way to denounce the cult of um, Dr. Martin Luther King, who, though a very admirable person, only felt able to express a perfectly decent and rational demand for fair and equal treatment for black Americans in Baptist terms. Very clever strategically, but because of the feeling that now is very wide, you say middle class, to me, and I had a feeling you weren't saying it in a flattering tone, but never mind. I have a thick skin, I have a broad back. Um, the entire white middle class has the absolute condescending view of black Americans that they like preachers. They like preacher men. It's almost like their sense of rhythm. They go for the pulpit. As a result of which, frauds of Chaucerian proportions, like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, automatically get the media baptism. They must be the spokesman for black Americans in some way. This is a qualitative degeneration of a terrific order. 
Mm. I've met Sharpton a lot. I've debated with him frequently. I mean, he's a religious businessman of the, of the most obvious kind. Um, he just proves what is proved often in this country, that you can get away with anything if you put reverend in front of your name, or if you can get people to call you reverend. So that's what has to be opposed. We have to have the fortitude to say no to those who are afflicted, to those who really are poor, to those who really are suffering, we will say, honestly, that those who offer them false consolation are not their friends. Who doesn't know by now that the cure for poverty is not charity in Calcutta? Who doesn't know that? Why did we suddenly decide to forget what we learned over the generations, that charity is an insult to the poor and a way of prolonging poverty? That Mother Teresa was not a friend of the poor, she was a friend of poverty. That there is only one cure for poverty, and that is, by the way, the liberation of women. And which, which, works, which works every time, against which all religion has always set its face, and against which Mother Teresa spent a lifetime campaigning to ensure that misery and poverty and dirt and disease and ignorance would continue so that there would be ever more people to testify to the Catholic faith. That's the way to face it. I, I want to address a couple of things that you said about human evolution because I'd like to take issue with them. Um, I think, in general, what you've been saying is wonderful, but I would not like you to talk about this general malaise of the human species. And this is what I would like to direct my observations about. First of all, you talk about this 100,000, 200,000, 50,000 year evolutionary scheme of humans being um, horrible and uh, out of control. But it seems to me, mm -hmm. I'm an ethnologist. Not really, no. Well, but I've studied human evolution for a long time. And it seems to me that there are really serious questions to ask about how human evolution evolved. And that has to do with the way religious people see us as a creature with some sort of supernatural or spiritual quality that had to appear someplace along our evolutionary line. Chimpanzees don't have it, and we do. When did that appear, and in what context? In an evolutionary context, it could occur only in a couple of ways. Number one, it could appear just like that, and you have it, and your folks don't. In which case, we're dealing with a, a very serious problem in how you deal with your folks who aren't human. On the other hand, it could appear gradually in a Darwinian gradualist way, and in which case, you're only half human, and you have only partially spiritual qualities seems to me that when we talk about human evolution and we want to use the quality of our evolved selves in dealing with religious people, what we ought to be doing is dealing with the impossibility of seeing this spiritual development in our own line. Well, I'm quite happy to take that as a comment. <laughs> and and I've been, it's been called to my attention that I, I committed an injustice a moment ago, I, I ought to have said it was Borders uh, Bookstore. That, uh, so would you mind switching your boycott? Uh, <laughs> thank you. I can't tell them apart, to be absolutely honest with you, but I do remember saying, whichever one it was, I wasn't going there ever again. <laughs> Though I'm a constitutional sure. lawyer, I moonlight as an atheist philosopher, and I've engaged some of the world's foremost Christian philosophers on college campus debates on God's existence. And I noticed, particularly in Missoula, Montana, four years ago when I debated Richard Swinburne in a formal debate on God's existence, that there is a hunger among college students for the specific technical atheist arguments against the existence of God. And I'm more than willing to interlope in the world of philosophy and study that as much as possible to do these debates. But I'm wondering, in your campaign for your book to the general public, have you found a similar kind of interest where there is a general receptivity on the part of many people to actually hearing 
the technical reasons why God does not exist or why we don't believe God exists? Well, I don't know about a hunger for it. I've found a lot of belief in belief, if I can put it like that. People say, well, you ought to believe in something. Um, President Eisenhower used to say that, you remember. He used to say, well, I'd, it's very important that you have a real faith and I don't really mind which one it is. Um, sort of Republican ecumenicism of a rather <clears throat> tepid sort, uh, but that, that goes, unfortunately, rather too well with certain kinds of soft multiculturalism. In other words, every, every fine, you know, you be a Jain and I'll be a Muslim and you be orthodox and so forth. It's kind of uh, oppressive, um, I'm okay, you're okay, multicultural uh, drizzle. Um, I don't, I think that all the ontological arguments for the existence of God were overthrown a long time ago. In fact, were overthrown well before our Darwin and Einstein. Uh, but that now, which is why I gave the example I did give, now that we do have a rough idea of the age and origin of our species and of our cosmos, that it simply isn't possible for religion to do the reverse engineering it once did. No one would uh, believe in this stuff if they started off knowing where we came from and, and how. Uh, it's just it has the advantage of being the first and the worst explanation uh, for, uh, because we are, we are pattern-seeking primates and that's a good thing, obviously, it gives us the itch of curiosity and innovation, but it also means that we will prefer very often a conspiracy theory or a junk theory to no theory at all. So that's the, the, the epistemological question that has to be resolved and I, I believe that we've succeeded in doing that. No, I prefer to argue that it would be horrible if it were true. I mean, I'm not an atheist, in other words, I'm an anti-theist. I, I don't, in myself, have any desire to live under a permanent, unalterable dictatorship. I don't, I don't wish it was true that I could be convicted of thought crime for what I was thinking when I was asleep, let alone for what I was thinking when I was awake. <laughs> And um, I don't wish for, an, uh, for a dictatorship I never had no part in choosing that would not cease to torment me uh, after I had died. I mean, I've actually been to all three of the axis of evil countries, the, and some other countries too, where the citizen is the permanent property of the state. When I was in um, a Christian prep school, I used to wonder what heaven would be like if it really did consist of everlasting praise. Sounded like hell to me. <laughs> But I, but I couldn't picture it, and nobody can, of course, but I've seen the nearest approximation to it, which is North Korea, where the, it is the only duty and job and right of a citizen to eternally praise the divine leader and his divine father. I'll expatiate it a little, if you like. North Korea is only one short of a trinity. But Kim Jong-il is only the head of the, of the party and the army. He's not the head of the state. The head, the head of the state is his dead father, dead for 15 years. It's a necrocracy. <laughs> Or I tried this, a thanatocracy, a morsalocracy. And, and it's, what, it's a life of constant groveling misery and fear and praise and thanks for the tiny handouts that you get. It's impossible to describe the nothingness of the life of a North Korean. But at least you can fucking die and leave North Korea. <laughs> And with, with religious totalitarianism, there is no escape. It is absolute, it's complete, it's utter, it's horrifying. Now, I say freely, non servia. I don't want that, and I don't respect anyone who does. So if they could prove it was true, I'd say you have all your work still ahead of you. But what a good thing it is that there's no evidence at all for such an obscene proposition. There. Say that I, I truly appreciate the sense of humor of the speakers and the audience here. I think that's one thing that goes um, sort of underestimated amongst uh, atheists is that they're a funny lot. Um, my, uh, my, my question is... Um, As opposed to the numerous comedians who run the uh, monotheistic world. <laughs> they don't realize they're being funny. You know? <laughs> um, uh, obviously the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been very divisive and controversial, um, but uh, there's, there's, there is definitely a school of thought that says that, uh, that this is an ideological war that the West had to fight or should fight against Islamic 
fundamentalism and religious extremism in general. And I, would, I, I know you've been outspoken on this, but I would like you to, if you don't mind, to just expound a bit on how you feel about the, the rectitude of this being um, an ideological war that needs to be fought. Well, it's an ideological war in the sense that I was just help, hoping to indicate that it's against a very vicious form of totalitarianism. A, a form, because totalitarianism, sorry, excuse me, totalitarianism will tend not to be content just with dominating the country that it happens to own. Um, it, it doesn't want its citizens to be able to compare notes with other countries. It doesn't want there to be other countries where that comparison can be made. It, it will always have an aggressive tendency. If this is um, theocratic, um, then it has an, e an even more sinister and, and equally uh, matching tendency, which is this. Try and run a society out of a holy book, and I'll tell you what will happen. It's been tried. All the children's teeth will fall out. Okay? The elevator won't go all the way to the top of the building. There won't be enough food. Um, there will be terrible microorganisms dining long and well on everyone in the society. It's, that just will happen if you do this. But you, when this failure, this terrible state failure comes, there is no means by which you can blame the failure on yourself. You cannot be self-critical about it. Why, therefore? Why is there hardly a blade of grass growing between Kandahar and Kabul? Why is there misery? Why, is there, why are there fistulas and um, ulcers everywhere? Because of the Jewish Crusader conspiracy, obviously. <laughs> which means we must export our violence and failure by force to other countries. Well, we have no chance of ducking this confrontation. I, I, since I think I understand the, some of the backstory of your question, I shall say now that anyone who says that there's a possibility of withdrawal for many of these countries is fooling themselves and trying to fool others. There's no, if we didn't learn one thing from 9-11 that seemed to me self-evident and obvious, we should have done. There is no over there and over here. For one thing, it's over here and censoring the Washington Post. And for another, when it breeds state failure and rogue statism, that's an immediate, imminent, direct threat to us, which I do not think was ever exaggerated. To the contrary, I believe the president and the vice president hugely understated the threat that was caused by societies like Iran and Afghanistan. People who say they inflated it are fools. And I relish the confrontation. And I think the 82nd Airborne is guarding us while we sleep. And I think that they're creating the space for my Iraqi and Kurdish and Afghan secular friends in a context in which otherwise they'd all be dead and we would have done nothing to help them. So, um, more than I thought. Very much. A little better, a little better than I thought, but not good enough. <laughs> you are involved in this fight, don't try and pretend you're not. And it will be going on only for the rest of your life, so you'd better decide quite soon which side you're on and how much have you done lately to help the fighters against religious terrorism in Afghanistan. What have you done lately to do anything about that? Ask that. It's too easy to uh, blame it all on Bush and Cheney. Very well. I'll take any more questions on that if I haven't been clear enough. This is on something else. Uh, you have a couple of really brilliantly succinct ways of sort of exposing the arrogance of religious people in claiming moral high ground and in claiming the provenance of morality by religion. Um, but sometimes I feel that uh, the best authors among you, and the best speakers particularly because you're limited in time when you speak, um, can sort of appear to have a facile treatment of how we, or um, maybe can fail to sort of, sort of stand up for the secular values in a positive way that we uh, espouse. And my question, I suppose, would be made clearer by um, pointing out that there's a lot in our biology that we know we want to leave behind. A lot of, uh, there are a lot of biological antecedents to some of the things uh, that women have to face in the world still today. Of course, they're made sacred by religion, but I'm wondering if you could brilliantly articulate in two minutes uh, <laughs> exactly what the principle is that you use to derive your morality. Well, I can't do it uh, aphoristically, I don't think, for you. Um, because I'm sorry to say your question wasn't epigrammatic enough. Didn't, didn't give me enough of an erection. Um, uh, but, 
But I can, I can, tell, you, I can tell you this, there, was, there are things I know that we all know here that I was never taught, okay? Uh, that I don't think I flatter myself by saying are innate in me, uh, to do with fairness, with the treatment of other people, with the, the care for others, that I expect and hope that they all manifest to me in return. My favorite example is taken from a, a very famous English book by Professor Richard Titmuss, He's a great old English socialist. It's called The Gift Relationship. And it's about why the British National Health Service has never had to pay anyone to give blood and has never run out of it. There's always enough blood. There are always enough donors. Uh, and the, the commercial element of it has been completely removed. Why is this? Because people want to be of help to other people. They positively like giving blood. I don't do it as often as I might. But when I do, I enjoy doing it. Um, there's something attractive about the idea. I don't lose a pint, because it replenishes quite quickly. But someone else gets one for free, like that. Um, I get a feeling of, well, not smugness, but a certain virtue out of, out of this. And it hasn't cost me anything. I'm not an altruist or a masochist. I don't feel I have to lick someone's feet in order to do them a favor. Um, and then I have a very rare blood group. <clears throat> And one day, I'm going to need a pint or two myself, and I hope that other people will have been behaving in the same way. Now, what is wrong with that as an explanation for human solidarity, as I prefer to call it, human morality, and, and the self-interest, uh, the evolutionary interest that's, in, that's involved in it? Does that suffice? I know it's not a twanging hard on. I knew it wouldn't. Um, OK. <laughs> Well then, so, all right, well, so why do women, now Matthew touched on this today, why are women the mainstay of religion? That's a very interesting question, which you seem to be asking. I'm sure I know what the answer to that is. Oh, do tell. Okay. <laughs> well, one, I, I think for a lot of men, the, the, the non serviam that I mentioned earlier, the refusal to be, to bow the knee to a, a paternal dictator, um, someone, what is it, uh, is it God is dead or God is dad? Uh, <laughs> I forget who said that, but anyway. Isn't as strongly felt among women. They tend to kind of quite like their fathers, if they're lucky. I mean, you generally do. Right? Often a lot, bit more than boys do. Um, so there's that. Um, and then I think there's the appalling risk that a woman has always had to take when she becomes gravid. I mean, she, she may die a, a, a death by torture, to bring this about, and may lose the baby as well. And then, if that doesn't happen, but this is well within our race and folk memory, if, if, that, if that's avoided, there's, the, there's no time of any day, I know this only slightly as a father, watching my daughter running, I think it's, I, it makes me uneasy to see my heart running around in someone else's body. But it's much tougher for mothers, as I don't need to tell you. And there's, and there's so many things that can go wrong all the time. And of course women go to the churches and they, they put little prayer flags out or they, 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 because they, they can't, if there's a small chance that it might help their child, they're going to take it. And I don't blame them. But uh, it is a terrible thing to see the mosques of Saudi Arabia filling with black draped babes um, at all hours of the day and night. And to see the terrible contract that's being played on them. But if this wasn't, the, if this wasn't true and if this wasn't the danger, wasn't the situation, we wouldn't need to be having this conversation. Hi, um, in making an observation, I kind of noticed that I seem to be the only Hispanic here. <laughs> and I was going to recommend that. No, no I, know, I know that's not true, but, but um, where is where's Rodriguez? Is He's back in the bar again, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'll join him later. Uh, but I was going to recommend maybe Ms. Dahlia next year could um, flash a hologram of the Virgen de Guadalupe on the side of the building. Yeah. Maybe, there you come. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm often asked why I believe as I believe or why I don't believe. And I think it comes down to an issue of personal responsibility that I think that you know when good things happen, it's like, oh, God is good. And, mm -hmm. and he was the, the initiator of that. When bad things happen, it's like, oh, that person was evil. And, and people ask me, well, don't you believe in evil and, and Satan making people do things? And I tell people, 
why don't we just take responsibility for our own actions? If we do good, let's rejoice in that. And uh, I probably committed a lot of the seven sins by, being hum um, by not being humble, being proud of my volunteerism, and working with the Katrina victims and so forth, going down to Louisiana on Labor Day. And uh, by the way, St. Bernard Parish firefighters, they still need help. Um, and people ask me why I don't believe in that concept of evil. And it's only because there are mean spirited people in the world and they choose to do so. And they sh it, be it would behoove them to act in a noble, compassionate way and they choose not to. The responsibility is on them. Well, um, I do believe in the existence of radical evil. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly why I do, but I could not say that I didn't. I uh, actually think I've seen it in, in practice a few times, sometimes on the grand scale. Um, like going through the bits of Iraq that Saddam Hussein's people had just combed through and seeing what they left behind. You can't, it's more than just violence and cruelty. There's a, it's what I call the surplus value of totalitarianism. It's the, it's the, the sadistic bit that you didn't really need to do, but somehow needed to. Um, and the reason why I say that is because it's done in a way that's often self-destructive. The need to, to be that cruel and that ghastly must be very strong because it's going to get you probably defeated and into trouble. It's a self-destructive element and it's very, very frightening to see. And then a couple of times I've met people who I'm certain are motivated not just by self-interest and extreme selfishness. And because we say of the psychopath, um, well of the sociopath I think, we say they don't really care about or know about the existence of others, so only their own lives matter to them. But the psychopath will, is a, a positive pleasure is derived from maltreatment of other people even at the cost of their own death. They, they have to do it, need to do it. I have no problem calling that evil. We need a word for it. By the way, if you, if you don't think we need a word for it, ask any Democrat at election time what they're about to do, and they'll say, lesser evil. <laughs> they need a word for it, don't they? Um, it, it needs to be in our lexicon, in my opinion. But does that kind of circumvent the fact that we do have um various people that do suffer from, say, like a mental illness, and we ascribe that to evil rather than actually providing them the help that they need. Well, no, a lot of mental illnesses aren't evil. I mean, as um, a great Colombian physician once said to me, if, if you hear a man praying to God, that's you may, talking to God, I'm sorry. <clears throat> if you hear a man talking to God, that we call prayer. But if you hear of uh, someone saying God talk to him, that's schizophrenia. All the evidence is that St. Paul, of, or I'm not going to call it St. Paul, but Paul of Tarsus, no, my son Paul, was an epileptic. All the, if, if, if there's anything reliable about the story, however, the same is true of the man calling himself the Prophet Muhammad. Um, I don't say that all religion is mentally disordered, but I say that it's inseparable from a form of delusion and hallucination. Um. About a year ago, I would consider myself a uh, uh, Jewish, not very religious, liberal. I uh, went on a journey, parts of the... Never heard of such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and after reading The uh, Blind Watchmaker and The, uh, the watch Selfish right? Gene, yeah. somehow I got moved towards uh, reading <coughs> books on religion. I am uh, not religious. Um, and after reading your book, uh, reading uh, End of Faith, reading God, Delusion, a number of other books. I would say I was an atheist for a week, and then one day I suddenly, when someone asked me, I realized that I was a, an anti-theist. And um, that, that's what I call myself. And I'm wondering, after listening to uh, Sam Harris's talk last night, which I enjoy, but maybe <coughs> think about that position and living in a very politically correct world, especially in California, I find myself on a regular basis uh, confronting and agitating my friends, my family, um, with this opinion, which I can't seem to let go of. And I was wondering if you could talk about being an atheist, being, I, you, you mentioned being an anti-theist a few moments ago, but what is your position on that, and sort of what are your words of wisdom? Well, I've already expended them. <laughs> In fairness, ladies and gentlemen, haven't I already answered that question? Yeah, yes. Um, I, I think I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to say next question. Okay, sure. Thanks. Only because we have so little time together. 
And after reading your wonderful book, Missionary Position, about Mother Teresa, I'm wondering if you're going to have a book about the Reverend Billy Graham, and if so, what would it be called? I have to think, I, we are told that the Reverend's um, career is coming peacefully to a close. And I certainly ho hope that that's true. Um, I regard him as a, <clears throat> I have to think of a title, and I will, um, I will by the, by the time he croaks. Um, <laughs> a book to, an interesting book to read, by the way, on him is written by a man, oddly enough, called Templeton, Richard's favorite surname. Um, <laughs> who was the Billy Graham of Canada for a long, long time, was very close to Graham himself, and uh, they would go on campus crusades for Christ together and so on, until Templeton realized that there was nothing to it, and, and said, said to Billy Graham, you don't believe this either, do you really? I mean, come on, you know, what, are the, what are the chances? And so, well, it's too late to change now. It's a living. You know, it's a, he has a very devastating quote, his last chat with Billy Graham. Good book, it's called Farewell to God. Jim Templeton, I think, was his name. Charles. Charles, Charles excuse me. Charles Templeton, excellent book. So there's that, which is, again, would make only the suggestion that <clears throat> Graham was another, or is just another figure from the partner's tale, just a, another <coughs> mendicant and fraud. But I think it's much worse than that. I think that uh, the evidence is that Billy Graham suffers from a, a very horrible disease, a, a, a version of paranoia um, that's known colloquially as anti-Semitism. Uh, it's impossible to be mentally or morally healthy if you suffer from this disorder. Uh, all the evidence of the Nixon tapes that we have, and it's in very great detail now uh, and verbatim, is that he and Billy Graham, when they got together, liked bo most of all to talk about that uh, and to jeer and, and, and taunt. Uh, it was sick with this, uh, this conspiratorial infantile uh, nonsense, and that's not pardonable, so one will have to be as well as quite satirical about him, I think very severe. And um, thus I don't feel uh, any sense of embarrassment or apology in saying that his, his, his death would not uh, in the least bit diminish our species. And that those who've fallen for him are very, very, very sadly misled. Since the, uh, uh, the Iraqi war came up, I can't help asking you what your rationale is for the fact we all agree that uh, Islam is a very dangerous religion, uh, that it's going to take some time to make inroads on it. I can't understand why you would defend us going into Iraq rather than Iran, and why you would think that we have any hope in a confrontation in winning without some really horrendous results. Let me see if I understand you. Let, rather, let me be sure if I understand you correctly. Are you in favor of a confrontation with the Iranian theocracy? No, I'm not. No, you're not. I thought not. not you're just using it again as a uh, means of uh, ridiculing the confrontation with Iraq. It's not, you're saying we went into the wrong country, so you should go neither. Well, well I've met I, people I, like you before. It's easy to read. That was not religious. Uh, controlled by a religious figure and create chaos yeah. rather than going into one that does have a religious figure. I mean, I'm not for either one, but... No, I, okay. I, I, know, I know where you're coming from, as they say. Um, <clears throat> an easy way to tell that someone doesn't know anything about Iraq at all is um, if they'll say one of two things about Saddam Hussein. One, well, yeah, okay, he was a bad guy. Then you know right away they don't know anything about him. No one who knew anything about the Saddam Hussein regime <clears throat> would content themselves with saying that. And second, to say he was a secularist. It's, I, I can tell right away that people have no idea what they're talking about when they say that. Saddam, Hussein, Saddam, Saddam, Hussein, Saddam Hussein's campaign of genocide in Kurdistan was called the Anfal campaign after a surah of the Quran about the spoils that you may take from the victim, or the devastation that you may inflict on them. <clears throat> was Saddam Hussein who, sensitive to the charge from Iran that he was a heretic or an unbeliever, put uh, Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag, that was 15 years ago, who forced all members of the Ba'ath Party in the last 10 years to undergo compulsory religious education, uh, who pumped out 
on radio and TV in Baghdad and throughout his embassies around the world, and as you all saw it, a constant stream of jihadist propaganda who undermined the secular PLO by, by paying, paying for the suicide bombers of Hamas and Islamic Jihad and paying a bounty for every suicide bomber, which we found confirmed in the Iraqi bank records, <clears throat> was the patron of jihadism in the region. Um, it was well beyond time that he was removed from office in Iraq, and I think the Senate did a good thing in 1998 and the House on the initiative of uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore to pass the Iraq Liberation Act, saying that year that it no, shall be... Not my that I'm coming. I'm, 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 I am answering your question, no, sir. Well, wait. I'm, I'm, I'm denying the assumption of your question that Saddam Hussein was secular, and I'm coming to Iran in a second. Okay. Thank you. He was quite right for the um, Senate to pass, but w without a dissenting vote, by the way, the Iraq Liberation Act, long before 9-11, and said it shall be the policy of the United States to remove Saddam Hussein from power. Now, it seems to me to come to Iran <coughs> that the Iranian theocracy is bent on a course of confrontation with us. It's resisted enormous bribes and inducements from the European Union, from the United States, and from the UN to allow us to be certain that its nuclear program is not directed at the acquisition of thermonuclear weaponry. Uh, it's a very suspicious course of conduct, uh, and all the evidence for its cheating on this comes not from the CIA, but from the International Atomic Energy Authority, from the European Union, and from others. We have them cold on this point. Second, <clears throat> they are conducting a campaign of murder and assassination in order to help uh, Syria gain control of Lebanon. No journalist or politician elected in Lebanon can hope to turn on their car in the morning if they're opposed to Syrian occupation and the Iranian backing of that, without the risk of murder. Um, they're the patrons of Hezbollah. Uh, their agents have been found trying to kill a novelist in London, uh, blowing up a Jewish community center in Buenos Aires, uh, murdering a Canadian journalist of Iranian extraction, and seeking for confrontation also in Iraq and Afghanistan. It, it seems that they think they can fight and win a confrontation with secular civilization that they so much despise. And it seems that the hubris that underlies this ridiculous campaign, after all, thanks to theocracy, Iran is a country where nothing works except the secret police and the nuclear reactors. Nothing works. The country is bankrupt. It makes, it exports just what it did at the time of the theocratic revolution, pistachio nuts and rugs. While a secular country like Turkey is practically a member of the European Union and has no oil. How do they think they can do this? Because they think the 12th Imam is coming back, because they too have a messiah, because they too have an apocalyptic uh, sense of the future. And pretty soon, a messianic regime is going to get hold of an apocalyptic weapon, the very moment we've all been dreading all our lives that this would happen. A regime that doesn't understand deterrence, that doesn't understand self-preservation, that has a religious worldview, will also have apocalyptic weaponry. Well, are you prepared to wait and see this happen? Or do you think that it would be worth fighting to stop that eventuality? I have no doubt. Anyone who wanted to guess my opinion would be insulting me. <laughs> I, live, I, live, I live to fight people like that. And I think the United States military has no higher calling than to destroy the regimes and, and disperse the armies of, of governments that threaten us in that way. And so I hope very much that though you, sir, uh, used Iran purely as a means of ridiculing the attempt to liberate Iran, uh, that you will find that the confrontation is both inescapable and just. This is the last question, Christopher, and I see that you're <coughs> anxious to have a cigarette. No, that's, a, that's, <laughs> that's not all I want. <laughs> Only, only two of the things that I want I could, could I do at this podium. <laughs> uh, you will be in the patio doing a book signing along with Ayan and Hushi Ali, and we're going to make an easy exit for you both through the kitchen so that you don't have to fight the crowd, and we will get you um, safely to your destination. And this is the last question of the afternoon. <coughs> Mr. Hitchens, my question is also related to the last question, uh, question of Iraq, as 
I like you like uh, confrontation and divisiveness more than homogeneity. It's more exciting. Um, according to some estimates, half a million people have died in Iraq, and there are some ideas that uh, more people will die in case of a war in Iran. And what do you think of the idea that confrontation leads to more violence against the forces of the United States and against us? As uh, yesterday's morning presentation also showed that the suicide bombings have increased in Iran, in uh, Iraq, during the course of the occupation. And uh, also that somewhat relates to back here at home as well, that the idea that the cartoon in Washington Post might have ignited more confrontation and violence with Islamic fascists as well. Yes. Well, I remember we discussed some of this about your, home, your country uh, the other night, and I'm grateful for the question. Yeah, there is, the, I think it's very, very important to get this clear. Um, it is, of course, true that the existence of um, secular, sexually emancipated, scientifically oriented civilization is the root cause of terrorism. I, I, I think it's true. I, because they would have nothing to attack and nothing to envy and nothing to blame their own failures on were it not for this state of affairs. But that's as much as I'm willing to say. I'm not willing to make any concession based on that. I'm not willing to adjust my own behavior by one degree for one minute to please some verminous mullah or any of his fans. And I think that should be clearly understood. I, I, could, not, I could not forgive myself if I, if I worked out ways in which to coexist with people with whom coexistence is first impossible, second undesirable. Um, yes, of course, if we were not trying to build up a federal democratic government in Iraq, the first ever such attempt made, and if we were not trying to get an oil plan that finally shared the oil instead of making it the private property of a sadistic crime family, of course we wouldn't be being attacked by the supporters of Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia. It's a matter of pride that they want to attack us. Um, and that's why there are so many casualties in Iraq, because they don't care where they put their bombs, and they don't care who they kill. In fact, they take a particular relish in killing uh, people who are from the wrong sort of Islam. It's a holy duty to put down the heretical Shia and to blow their children's limbs across the schoolyard, and it's a relish that's experienced every day, and there aren't enough soldiers in the world to stop the number of people who want to do this. But we're not going to give up on it, and we can't conceivably surrender on the point. And if the body count is to be used as an indicator at all, then it must be used in a serious and scrupulous manner. Millions of people died in Afghanistan because we didn't intervene there, because we left the country, because we abandoned it after the war against the Soviet Union was over. Millions of people died in Iraq because we left Saddam Hussein in power in 1991. Uh, who knows how many millions of lives in, in Iran have been made miserable. We certainly know how many people were killed in the war uh, with Iraq because the theocracy was left Un undisturbed there. Are we proud of the way that we neglected and abandoned uh, Somalia uh, to its fate in the way that we did? No. And all of this neglect and indifference and neutrality is what's led to the rise of the terrorist organizations. And you only have to look at what bin Laden says himself. He said defeating the Soviet Union was really hard. He says it at the wedding of his, one of his ghastly kids to one of Ayman Zawahiri's filthy brood. Um, it's a very important tape to listen to. He said, many of us here lost many good friends in the great struggle to liberate Afghanistan from the Soviets. That was really hard fighting. This was, that was a real jihad. That was really a bitter war. He said, but bringing down the next empire, the American one, that'll be relatively easy. They're feminized. They're queer. They're run by Jews and usurers. They don't want to fight. They don't believe in their own principles. They don't think anything's worth fighting for. They can't take casualties. Bring it on. We'll take them down easily. That'll be simple. It, it is to me fantastically important, and really of the first and highest importance, that that statement and the assumptions underlying it be comprehensively disproved. Comprehensively disproved. And their authors, those who make excuses for them, comprehensively destroy. That's going to be the big fight between uh, secularism and civilization and its enemies from now on. You better get ready for it. Thank you. Thank you.